Well, thank you for the lovely introduction and uh, thanks for the invitation to come over here. I always like to come over and visit our friends in the, the land of the long white cloud. The uh, last time I was here was the morning you lost the America's Cup. Uh, yet when I got up the next morning and read the newspaper, you'd actually won the America's Cup, which was really interesting because everybody had said how well you'd done and how... The so when I went back to Australia I, and read the paper, they said we'd actually won the America's Cup because everybody on that boat was Australian. So <laughs> it's... Uh, anyway... Uh, it's good to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I was going to say Madam President but uh, Jack has said don't refer to me as a Madam so I won't use that term. I feel uh, uh, a little uh, daunted being up here in front of a whole lot of insurers. Usually I'm in a, in a group where they're sycophants of mine and they make fun of me so I guess in some ways I, I feel uh, a little like a condom, you know. Um, you know what I am. You don't like using me. You think I interfere with the process, and uh, and uh, if you could get rid of me, you would. And eventually, when you're sick of using me, you discard me because you won't go direct and try and get all the business that we've hard worked hard to get. So, I guess that that's that's how I feel. But there are a few. Uh, I have to be very careful what I say. I'm a public listed company on the Australian ASX now, so I can't say anything sexist or or sexual or anything like that when I speak publicly. So. But it's a long way away from Australia, so maybe I'll get away with it. <laughs> yeah. um, my, my job is I've been given a few points. I've been asked to talk about it. Uh, I won't be uh, prescriptive, as others before me may have been in a little while ago. Um, I'll, I'll give you the benefit of my 43 years' experience in this industry. I'll give you the benefit of what I do, which is flog insurance. I'm a commissioned salesman. Uh, I'm a carpet bagger. I'll do whatever I can do, do to get business uh, and I'll give you, uh, I travel overseas extensively, uh, I've been doing that for 30 odd years, I have a lot to do in the London market uh, and uh, I have a lot to do in the North American market. So I'll just give you a little bit of a, an idea of some of the stuff that we've done so, and, and it's just, it'll be my opinion based on what I think, so it's all working with a bit of luck. Beautiful. Um, consolidation. We're watching it around the world at the moment now. You're, you're seeing all the larger brokers who have completely screwed up their uh, top end by c crucifying one another, by, by, by prostituting the fees they charge, trying to step down into the middle section. Um, you're witnessing that with Gallagher's doing acquisitions, Marsh doing acquisitions, all around the world. Um, they come to Australia and, uh, and, they, and they look at New Zealand and they say, we've got to get into the SME sector. And it's very hard to get into these sectors because of the... Uh, degree of uh, uh, cost there is in operating, but I'm seeing that everywhere. I'm seeing that in I'm seeing that in the UK. I'm seeing it in uh, in Asia. But, uh, all the Asian distribution networks are looking at how they can reduce their costs at the moment. So I think you're going to find that the mid market uh, where I where I operate in is uh, is, is very much under pressure to see wh wh whether more and more can join together. So all around the world, uh, in the uh, not so much in the Nordic countries, but certainly through uh, through uh, Europe uh, and, and England, uh, there are consolidated models happening. People are joining together, people are coming. And the, the reasons for that is purely that s the people have made a lot of money out of you by screwing you guys down and getting stuff really cheaply and putting it in the market very expensively with, uh, uh, backed up with fees on the top of it, uh, are using that capital that they've done all around the world to actually try and step down into this lower area of, of where we operate, the poor humble uh, distribution of SME where we are. So that's the number one thing I'm seeing all around the world is consolidation. I'm seeing a huge push into the, uh, into the South American market. I'm seeing sophistication in distribution uh, going from the, the tired agency forces. And I guess the other, the other distribution that I witness is tired agents. And uh, I've, I've, I've had a look at uh, all state, state farm and progressive. I've been in their offices I've looked at their distribution over the years and the, the tired agency network seems to work extremely well around the world in areas where, uh, where legislation allows it to operate. And, and I guess w what's, what's being developed more and more in that tired agency network is that they're now looking at uh, how they can spread that with more product. And in doing that, sometimes they have to step outside their agency network and we're seeing that... Uh, Companies like Progressive have come into Australia to uh, only operate in um, internet and not operate in direct. Yet in America they have a 70-30, 70% tied, 
uh, and, uh, and uh, co-tied agents and 30% uh, intermediated. So there's more and more movement now to consolidate uh, distribution and to consolidate the product range that the tied agency networks are operating in. in the Europe's looking very carefully at Scandinavia, which has uh, managed to uh, cut out commission and seeing what that's doing for distribution if it's and if it's not creating any form of impact on, com on uh, competition. And uh, the, the whole EU uh, are looking at that in terms of whether th that might be a good way to go. So we've got in Australia uh, FOFA uh, as well, looking at whether uh, the money that's been ripped out of uh, the consumer by the... Uh, by the financial planners over the last three decades can be recouped in some way by looking at the rather neat and nice uh, um, general insurance distribution. We haven't done that too much. So I think that's another area that's really all around the, all around the globe is moving, particularly in Australia. You're seeing um, uh, uh, agency forces building up from uh, 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 authorised rep uh, distribution networks. In our own uh, company, we have nearly... Uh, 2,800 authorised reps that run through Australia. So it's just solidifying it. So uh, direct insurance is, uh, is something that's pushing, coming further all the time. Uh, in Australia, we've turned our back on uh, house, and house and car. Uh, it's commoditised. It's, it's price-driven. Yeah. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any reason to intermediate it because nobody believes that you require an intermediary. We've allowed that nearly 50% of the Australian uh, uh, population um, um, uh, in GWP is done with direct insurers. So I'm seeing that that direct part is now being pushed away a little bit by people saying it's very expensive to sell business over, uh, over a direct agency force. It's better to sell it over the internet. We're seeing uh, startup companies doing that. UE in Australia is doing extremely well with that. Uh, but they started with a very big purse and they are, they're eroding that quickly at this stage. Uh, budget Direct has done very well over there. You've got Real Insurance, which has picked up. They're, they're all working in tied or direct uh, agency forces or not in a broad spectrum and m m moving as quickly as they can into the, into the internet and going forward from that point of view. So I'm seeing... Um, uh, a huge amount of that coming forward. Everybody's looking at the cost of producing that type of business. Um, you're seeing um, price being a predetermining way it's done, being done all the time. And now, uh, as, a, as most of the companies have got a really big footprint across that whole area, they're sort of like looking to other ways of doing it. And I guess the best way for a large uh, capital provider to do a bigger spread is to actually look into affinity. And affinity marketing is probably one of the best ways of doing that, but it, c it comes with some pitfalls. You've got the Coles and Woolworths over there at the moment trying to emulate the success of tes Tesco. Um, and you've always got the problem that uh, QBE came up against with the with their uh, Wells Fargo issue where they were forced to place insurance and... Uh, the pricing structure was a little bit was it was it was exaggerated in, in in regard to what the remuneration level should be, and so people looked at that and said that's not fair. It's not it's not QBE's fault. It's probably the fact that when you get into affinity marketing, people that want to do that, and that's the affinity itself, they want to make a lot of money out of your capital, and they want to make a lot of money out of their distribution or their or their affinity or the people they do. So what you're watching now in Australia. Uh, and uh, in, in particular is that movement away from, well, we won't go out into the market and, and, and hang out our show shield. We'll put our brand behind something and we'll see how people come to it. So it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to watch that at the moment from uh, as a bystander because as, uh, when, w when you see this start to develop, they're all things to all people. And then when you see it, start to mature and it's a couple of years into it, you see them start to be selective about where they do things and what, which way they go forward. So it's not, doesn't, it's not a golden panacea for everybody, it's actually a defined way to make money. And I'm just wa wondering at the moment whether um, the uh, Woolworths model may be better than the Coles model. I make no comment on this. The Woolworths model says we'll go and rent somebody else's capital, we'll just give you our client base and you do your best and give us a defined margin. And then the Coles model is where you put the power of West Farmers behind it. You turn around and say, okay, we'll use your capital. We'll, we'll get a, a, a 
a, a market presence and will solidify the segment that we want to go after that segment. So I need no, neither of those are at any mature stage at the moment. But it's, it's interesting to see that um, um, that's the how people see to go forward. They do the, they do the retail, then they look at the next, the next obvious move is, uh, is to walk into the small to medium enterprise, which, uh, which our friend from the Labor Party seems to understand explicitly after having been asked that question by our friend up the back and he answered it without any understanding whatsoever of how insurance works. So it would be very interesting. I was going to put up my hand and, and advise him that the biggest uh, liquidation in Australia up before HIH was the GIO, the Government Insurance Office of New South Wales, with somebody in the audience who did very well out of buying, buying it out. Uh, uh, they, they thought it was smart to have their reinsurance division uh, insure satellites. Um, and as nobody would, uh, would, that would insure satellites, they thought, well, we've got a big capital base and we're government back, we'll insure them. And uh, uh, which, as you may or may not know, when they were developing satellites, there was a lot of them went, <laughs> they didn't actually <laughs> go up like that. So it was, uh, it was rather an expensive exercise. So every time government decides it'll get into commerce and have a go at things, I, I actually say, let's just step back a couple of years and see how this all goes. So I was too polite to, to, to tell that story in front of him, so he seemed like a really good guy up until that time he opened his mouth and didn't know <laughs> what he was talking about. Uh, I thought, gee, this guy's really clever. And, uh, <laughs> then I realised he was a politician. <laughs> uh, I, I can say that here, I can't say it in Australia, otherwise everything we do will be under scrutiny. Uh, so affinity is becoming miles and miles, mi very important, it's, it's, it's a way forward. If you've got a reason to do stuff, it's a great way to do it. So the impact of Lloyd's, uh, unfortunately Kent stayed, so I can't say what I was going to say. So, uh, 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 otherwise next time I'm in London I won't be able to get up to the 12th floor. Uh, <laughs> people underestimate the power of Lloyd's and, and, they, and people don't understand its capital and its strength. And he alluded to that by saying um, uh, uh, corporate capital has come into it. Uh, no, I never was a name, thank God. Uh, uh, the reason I never became a name was I, j I broke to too many syndicates uh, who at, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and look at what they looked like at four o'clock in the afternoon in the early days of London and decided that I would never trust anybody that got that pissed at lunchtime with my <laughs> capital. So, uh, apart from that, it's, uh, it has survived since 18, no, 1888 and, uh, and it's, uh, it's done okay. It doesn't own its building anymore, but that's okay. I wouldn't own something that wasn't finished like that either. I'd want one finished. <laughs> if I had it, I'd want it to be finished rather than have it unfinished with all the sewer outside it. Um, the, 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 the benefit of Lloyd's is that it's now looking at itself. Instead of being the, um, the way it used to be, where it was a, a whole lot of you know, almost sycophantic relationships where people did business, they're actually looking at how you can streamline process, how you can actually make, make things go through seamlessly. And, uh, and I think they're going to emerge and are emerging and we, we have a few projects going with them at the moment into an absolute powerhouse in terms of wh when they start to transmit things electronically and go forward. So I think the impact of Lloyd's is starting to be felt over the next uh, half, de half, de half decade around the world. And it's a very, it's a very impressive, uh, uh, I'm at looking at it from the inside and out, I can say it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolute powerhouse and when it, when it actually gets its back office systems running smoothly and operationally it's going to be unbelievable to stop. So Lloyd's, global view. Uh, remuneration. The, uh, this is, uh, I mean, it was, it was a great situation when, uh, when uh, uh, Spitzer found out that there was a uh, contingent commission going on and, that, uh, and, and, uh, and decided to fix it. And, uh, uh, it, he fixed it really greatly. Um, they just simply said, well, we're not having contingent, contingent commission, we're just going to extra 3 to 5% commission from tomorrow. And you all went, yep, terrific, we'll stop doing consi consistent. Remuneration is the biggest issue that I see around the, the world. John Neal alluded to it about a month ago, or two months ago, by saying the, the com commissions can't keep being paid at the level they were. He was talking about 30% commissions and 33% commissions. Lloyd started it about two years ago, they said, we can't pay 33% deductions, we have to bring them back. So those high-end commissions are going to come under some pressure. They're coming under pressure all around the world 
and, and insurers that are laying down their capital and working out that, that brokers are making more, bit more money out of their capital than what they are, they're, getting, they're wising up. So I think it's going to come under pressure. I think it's logical that it comes under pressure. Remuneration should be fair, it should be appropriate and it should represent the risk that the distribution channel puts in to what it does to make those products get put through and go forward. So yeah, watch, watch remuneration, it's coming. I know that doesn't sit well here because I know insurers here like to pay a lot of money to their intermediaries, but um, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Uh, technology, it's everywhere. Everybody's got a system. Everybody's wa got a way to do it. Everybody's putting it through. The problem is that technology was basically driven out of North America and it's very hard to do any technological uh, uh, anything sexy in North America because you're dealing with 50... Uh, countries with 50 different jurisdictions but this is coming it's getting to a stage where people are saying the paper wall that we do the way we transact business the fact that we cannot uh, have people that we used to pay $25,000 to and we're paying them $80,000 we can't do that transaction it's got to be done more electronically it's coming Lloyd's is over the top of it most people that are getting smart are saying how can we take out the human cost in transmission of data and I'll talk to you a little bit further about that. So that's, uh, that's absolutely crucial and coming. Uh, new capital. So I was going to ask them today, uh, I was going to ask the guy from Genre, if you're still here, Mo, uh, my apologies. I was going to ask him what he thought about sidecars today, but I thought that might be appropriate to ask in front of people. I mean, we're seeing a whole series of things. You know, you're seeing sidecars coming in, you're seeing regression um, um, uh, treaties being placed. Um, Interesting though, but if you think about the, the insurance world, which is around 600 million or a bit more, and you think about the reinsurance part of that, 330, about 330 billion of that 600 plus billion. And if you think about how much has gone in cat bonds and sidecars and, 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 and anything you want to sex up in a certain way, but it's just redoing it, it's about 45 billion of that. Um, the chances of that getting up to being 100 billion or 200 billion I think one of our speakers really spoke care clearly on that today where he said, do you want to move hedge fund money, do you want to move uh, money out of uh, superannuation funds and, and roll the dice? And the answer to that is you will not be allowed to do that by regulators. Regulators will allow you to roll a little bit of the dice and that's appropriate because it, but they won't allow you to write a lot. So I think that the new capital is going to come in, it's going to be a bit cavalier. I'm not going to say anything about what... Uh, Berkshire Hathaway did, but when you've got a balance sheet like that, you can do anything you want. So, I mean, and <laughs> I mean, uh, it makes me laugh when I see new capital coming into here because it was only, what, uh, three years ago you couldn't place anything in New Zealand. I mean, I have to laugh, you can't place a SME risk in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Christchurch in certain areas. Well, I can tell you there's, there's about 10% of Australia you can't place insurances in either. It's, it's just not possible to do it. But... I think new capital's here. I think there are some different moves. The sidecars are exciting, uh, where you look at the, where you can st stick your capital in and pull it out because you haven't had a claim. So that's, I think, from a world perspective, that's really, w w they're, they're the things that are driving change, driving trend. I, I look, I've got to read this out. It wasn't something I was going to read. I, I, I normally don't read. Okay. Successful non-mining expert industries seem to be impossible in Australia without a significant, significant decline in the currency because costs are too high and firms are uncompetitive. Mining and energy industries are competitive because labour is a low proportion of cost of production. The car industry is dying despite a boom in car sales because it's fundamentally uncompetitive. High costs, high dollar costs are leading to high import costs and very low export. The countries that are buying our cars, that uh, are, 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 are countries are buying our cars uh, only when they have to. They're not buying our cars because they need it. Unfortunately, in the non-mining sector, our cost of labour in Australia is too expensive. So if you Kiwis want to work for nothing over here, you'll be able to export things as well, the same as we. I can we are competing, we're paying nearly $900 a week for somebody in the car industry in Australia that somebody in South Korea that's got a very good, very good uh, uh, lifestyle, lives well, owns a small house, educates their children that are paying somewhere around a third of that for. So how in God's name are we going to be able to make cars in Australia 
make them competitive and when we, our labour cost is three times everybody else's. By the way, we also make cars that we like but nobody wants to buy, so that's another problem as well. <laughs> everybody likes HSVs and everybody likes those sort of things, but nobody buys them. <gasps> you know, so, okay, so that's just a bit of an idea. Of th that's my view of what I've seen around the world, and I travel around the world five or six times a year, so I, I've got a bit of a thing on it. Now, this is, I'm just trying to tell you what a broker does, okay, because I know some of you in your lofty operations don't quite understand what a broker is. So I put this up here so that you understand clearly what it is, right? Assist prospective insurers. Look, read it there. It's beautiful. I love it. Right? We've got to developing risk management strategies appropriate to their risk profiles. I, I, get, I get all shaky when I read that, okay? Because that's what an insurance broker is. So that's what we think we are. That's... We think we're Lara Bingle. Does anyone know who Lara Bingle was? She's one of our models. She, uh, she went out with our, uh, our uh, cricket captain for a while. Um, and when she stopped, he stopped going out with her, we, he started to bat better. So I can only presume that um, they walked on the beach a lot together or something. That's what insurance brokers think now. They're going, hey, come to us, you insurers. We're fantastic. You know, we're lovely. <laughs> but unfortunately, th this is probably what you guys think we are, right? Okay, which is, uh, which is, you know, uh, here thing. Most of, most of the middle of office is nothing. It's completely barren, okay? And all the peripheral things around there, you know, sharks, deranged gunmen, bloody... I know it's a bit of a slide I've done, I, I've, done in, I've done in England a couple of times, but it's true. So somewhere between that, right, and that is, you know, we've got to get our perceptions about what insurance brokers are and what they look like, okay? So I'd like to think that we look more like Lara Bringle, but which gets me back to remuneration. I said we talked about remuneration before. Th th this guy's a genius, right? Look at this guy. <sighs> you can read it. It's only just come out. He's been sentenced. He ripped everybody off. He's been putting out 60%. He's been increasing the cost of. Now, I know there's a bit of discussion in this country about uh, brokers charging fees and that, uh, that uh, there are some insurers that think that they shouldn't. Well, I guess this guy got away with it since 1998. I don't think anybody's doing that, but that's, that's the stuff that you can't put up with. But the fee structure that you must put up with and what you don't understand as insurers sometimes is that the cost of a, of, of a broker placing business, giving advice, and getting two or three quotes is horrific. So it's not just what you see. So sometimes, and I always remember in 2003 when the Insurance um, uh, Brokers and Agents Act was up, uplifted and the, and the um, um, Financial Services Reform Act was put in. I, I actually did a gig here in 2002 uh, for, for, for IBANs and I said, this is coming and I spent uh, two two-hour sessions telling you guys all about what RG145 would mean and RG166. And at the end of it, you've all said, they'll never legislate that in, the, in New Zealand. And I went, oh, it's coming. You were right. I was wrong. You didn't, leg you didn't regulate it, okay? You did a little bit of regulation, but not. So wh what I'm saying is that please don't confuse the cost of remuneration that a broker charges with your cost of putting business out. Your cost of business putting business out is predicated by this, okay? And I won't go bore you with it. It's the usual, why do things go up and why do things go down? It's, a, it's the curve, right? So when you lose money, you put your prices up. When you don't lose money, you compete for it. Capital's king, away you go. That's, that's an old graph. Now, you had a horror time with, with uh, Christchurch. We all felt for you. I've, I've been in a couple of meetings with John Clayton from Marsh where he's still comes to tears about the people who died. Okay? We've had our own. That's Yazi. That's what we have. That's the Australian continent and that's the picture from space of Yazi over the top of it. So Australia is a pretty bloody big place. I don't know if you know that. And that's a very big storm. So Yazi hits. It looks like this. That's Early Beach. Okay. What's going on? This is what's on public television. Okay. Now, that's the main south bank of Brisbane, all right? And the stuff that you can see is the water, okay? That's the Brisbane River coming past there. They did the, one of the most beautiful jobs of building south bank. They did terrific. 
had they put a two metre bund wall for about 400 metres, the whole of that south part of Brisbane would have gone what water. So the new insurers competed like hell to get that capacity there. It was, it's beautiful, it's beautiful buildings to insure and when you walk over here, there's the Brisbane River, okay? And in 1974, see the top of those roofs there, okay? The, the first set of roofs, that's where the water level would have been. So you went, what mitigation's been done? No, you didn't do any of that as insurers. You went, what have you done to make sure that you've put all the appliances that run the building going on the, up on the roof, not on the floor? You did nothing like that. What you did was, you competed like hell to get that business. And what happened was, when, the client, when, the, when it fell and it hit like that, and that's what occurred, you went, I don't think you got flood cover. Uh, see that? It's the main street of Ipswich. There's 80-year-old people that live there had never seen water in it. It's up high and it came down. And one of the major insurers said, I don't care if it came up here and the water's down there, it's flood. Okay? So that's what the public saw. They saw that. Oop, they saw that. They saw this, and they saw this. This is the heart. Oop, you're right. It did flow up a bit. There, they saw that. Okay, that's what the television showed. This poor little kangaroo was absolutely drowned. So everybody was pumped. Right? Everybody was pumped. Okay. Now, so this is. And I'm sorry, I can't do both of this end, but this is. This is the graph that Mo couldn't show you this morning. It's the graph of catastrophes and major events in Australia. And you'd have to say, up here, it was pretty benign, okay? All right? Then bingo. That's what you'd expect. If you're an underwriter, you'd expect to have some benign years and then get hit on one. Then you have a couple more benign years and then it starts to escalate. It starts to go up here. And then bang, of course, that's the 10, 11 flood. So, if that's your loss history, right? You've seen the whole public seeing how bad it is. It's on the television. You've seen the poor bloody kangaroo, okay? okay. You've seen the three kids with the pregnant mo wife standing there saying, we don't know if we're going to get paid. You know your loss ratio is crook and you turn around and you're saying, brokers force the premiums down. It's your capital. It's not our capital. It's your capital. So naturally, you put the prices up. Oh, hang on. Wait a sec. This is our biz pack. This is Steadfast biz pack. For last year, 2012, there was $813 million at a premium in that. Okay, so what stayed? Loss ratio, 40.09 in 08. Okay, 40.39 in 9. 10 and 11, okay, uh, when your uh, loss ratio. 10 and 11... Uh, when the floods hit, bingo, all right. Uh, we put in an 18% cost across there. That's not profit, that's the cost of running the place, right? And so Jackie can go back over to IAG's head office in the jet and for the meetings and things like that. It comes out of that 18%. The commission, the commission, 23.5%, same all the way along. So the combined loss ratio is 89. Oh, beautiful, oh, fantastic. Woof, woof, woof. Average loss ratio of those periods, 93.43%. Okay. What did you do? You did bloody nothing. Okay. Nothing. You had a couple of percent here. You had the pictures. You had the heartfelt shock. You had the deterioration. I showed you the map. And you kept going along like that. Just, it's not on a slide, but I'll read it to you. In 2004, the insurance on 25.51 million billion in sales, there was the, the, the profit was 14.5%. In 2012, on 35.4 billion, it had dropped to 9.2%. If I went to my board and said, the good news is we made 9.2%, the bad news is we used to make 14.15%, I would be looking for a job. But, so, what's that? It's a two-ton elephant. 
where the two tonne elephants sit, any friggin' place they want to normally, okay? So, why have I got it on there? Why have I got it up there? Because change comes from within. Conditioned response. When the elephant was this big, they tied it up with a rope and it went, right? As it got bigger, they tied it up with a chain. You can't tell me that two tonne elephant couldn't just go <coughs> and pull that out if he wanted to. He could, absolutely easily, but he won't. He doesn't, because he's conditioned, he's conditioned. Insurance brokers force prices down, you can't put your price up, you lose market share. Oh. Okay, we've got eight, min eight and a half minutes to do 30 minutes, so let's see how we go. All right, right. We need to respond to increasing costs. Costs and market conditions. Our cost of production is going through the roof, okay? Insurance brokers are... Uh, I'm seeing it all the time. When I, when I first started in 1969 as an insurance broker, I got out of jail in 68, so it was a really good time to start, <laughs> right? Um, m about 18% of my commission and fee income went in wages, okay? Now the average is 54%, okay? So you, can, you either sit back and go, this is going to go through, or you start doing something about it. We need to do our business more smarter with you. Okay, we have to do it smarter. I think your battery's dying, or maybe my battery's dying. Uh, we, have to, we have to make a profit from the transactions the same as you do, okay? So this is what we're faced with. We're faced with this incredible paper challenge between ourselves, right? Okay, that's the public and product liability prop for a few people there, okay? All right? So this is what it should look like. Boink. One for everybody. And you should be able to transmit that one to all of you. You should be able to write off it. You should be able to do it electronically. You should, and you should get it back electronically. And the people relationship should be done at the relationship part, not at the processing part. So we've all done it. Everybody's done it. Right? We've all got them. We've all spent a fortune. I know what Ian spent. They shared with me. Uh, I don't know what Mark spent. Uh, I don't know what Ozbroke has spent. I know what we spent. Uh, we spent $8 million <laughs> getting our pro platform done. So, broker platforms, they're the way of the future. You've got to start doing business this way. You've got to start, keep the relationship so that you trust the broker or you don't, but you've got to start moving it to you. It's a, it's a, it, it provides a solution for your clients, for the broker's clients' needs. It's coming. Huh? It's a tool. It's not a how to drop the prices down. But what it does do is if you go to brokers and you say, if you renew 85% of your business with us, we'll give you this or we'll do that. It's, a, it's the ability for you to bid at the market price you think you can make money at for your business. It allows you to price every bit of risk that comes in that you want. It means you've got to be smart, but then you're the ones with the balance sheet. You should be smarter than what we are. We're the ones that are doing the selling. So what I'm saying to you here is uh, six minutes to go. It allows brokers to, up, uh, to, to access a complete range with a complete range of insurers without any people being involved in it. It's electronic. You spend a little, bi a little bit on the electronic, you spend a big bit on saving your product, saving your cost. Gives you access to as many products as you want. They're there. Start embracing them, okay? And lastly, the pro broker's got a chance of making a profit, so you might find the fees can drop a bit because their cost of production goes through. So please look at that. Okay, data's becoming king. I'm on a real timeline, guys. I'm going to rush it with you and ladies and others. Oh, this is, this is New Zealand, not Australia, not Sydney. Uh, data's becoming king. Right? God, I, I thought Anzac was something between Australia and New Zealand 30 years ago. I thought Cresta was a Vauxhall that people drove around in. Sick, I thought they'd left the K off it, okay? But it's becoming part of my life now because of, of, of the need. I put their brothels versus Gloria Jeans. What do I mean by that? Okay, well, big data in America says that if you want to insure anything, within about a half to three quarters of a mile radius of a Gloria Jeans, insure anything you want because they never burn down, they never get... That's what big data does. The reverse data says if it's a brothel, okay, then it's going to be in an area where there's going to be problems. So big data is going to come and it's going to rule our life. It's here now. Advertising market share, customer choice. They're the things that are driving everything. I mean, 
the, how many ads do you see where they go, we've got the best insurance policy in the world. We pay all our claims. We've got the lowest FOS uh, rating for the type we do. And if anybody, and if anybody has a problem, this is my personal mobile phone number, ring me up. What you see is, and it is changing, IAG is one of those that's changing it. You see, Ch Shirley Jean saved $378 by going this way. As long as we keep pricing on price, we're not going to get anywhere. We're stuffed. We have to start making our advertisements say what we do. We're, we're in the game of protecting assets. We're there when it hits the fan. Okay, they asked me to say a bit about me. Okay, I started in the insurance industry in 1969. I went broke in 1974 and it took me eight years to pay back the $114 million I went broke for. It's interestingly, nobody would give a stuff or know that nowadays except me. It ruined my life for eight years. I got an idea in, I was a practicing broker. I was tribunalized by Lloyd's in 1979, basically because they paid big commissions and, and had great lunches in those days. That was one of the reasons I did it. And wrote every bit of shit I had, which was fantastic, which was, uh, pardon, I don't know, that's changed, Kent, my apologies. Um, <laughs> It's an Australian slang term for uh, non-traditional risks. Uh, <laughs> uh, in, in, uh, in the, uh, the mid-90s, you were all giving your capacity out to the internationals and in buckets and knocking 30 and 40 percent off my price. Okay? I said to 43 brokers in New South Wales, if we don't pull together, we're going to be an antiquity. You, you want to work for whoever they are, th there was about 12 in those days before they'd all bought one another. They all said, no, we want to try and survive. So we set up Steadfast. And it was 280 brokers and we floated on the Australian Stock Exchange on the 2nd of August and it hit a market cap of $730 million day one. And people rang me and said, how'd you feel? I sort of felt numb. But uh, an idea I had, um, <laughs> I'm standing in the ASX with three quarters of a billion dollars worth of market cap. I didn't think I was smart or clever. I thought that all the people who backed us and pulled together, our, our cat's cry was none of us is as good as all of us. I stole that, I thought, from some football coach in North America. It was actually one of the McDonald brothers who said it in the 50s. So it's funny how things step on your mind. It showed that if you pull together in any environment, if you let your egos stay at home, if you work very hard on a product and to get collegiate effect that you can be successful. Our market cap this morning was 831 million. So what, however, I, what I've stayed doing that because I believed in the industry. I loved what I did. People say to me, how do you motivate yourself now? I go, every day I get up, I enjoy what I do. And what I want to say to you, if you're sitting out there every day, you don't get up and enjoy what you do, get out of there, what you're doing. It's a great industry, it's been fantastic to me. Okay, so this is what it was. We went from a buying group to a cluster to a plus of data. I've got a million, minute to go, I promise. Um, we were sitting in what's called um, the due diligence uh, went uh, uh, about a month before we floated. And they said, uh, you're, not a, you're not a cluster anymore, are you? I went, no. Uh, you're not a buying group because you stopped that years ago. <laughs> so we had, we had 26 people debate for an hour and a half what we would call what it was. Anyway, we didn't resolve it. And I went home and I wrote a half page to the 26 people. Uh, and I said, we're now a closer data, closer data. And they went, what's a closer data? I said, everything we used to be, we're now here. Uh, so that name stuck. It's a, it's a combination, as you can see, of cluster and consolidator because we're now consolidated what we do. So things can change and morph into other things. Now, why did we come here? Uh, I like bluff oysters. Uh, I thought you were going to win the America's Cup, so I could make an excuse and get a trip over here to watch the America's Cup. You screwed that on us, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. okay. I always, I felt it was in stupid for us to have Australia and not have um, East uh, Bondi stuck over there because, I mean, it, was, it, it seemed insane for us not to be part of you. I'd looked for years here. I'd never seen a, a group that we could get involved with. So why did we choose Rossbury? <laughs> ah, gee, well... Uh, they were naive and we took advantage of them and we bought it cheap. <laughs> <laughs> we, bought, we bought it cheaply and they didn't know it was worth more money than what it was. I have to tell you, the, the reason we bought it is that for 12 years they've been fully audited. They've run their business exactly the way you should run your business. They've run accounts correctly. Yeah, I know they're aggressive, I know they're, they do stuff, but 
The reason we bought them is we liked their, the way they did business and they knew how to make money. And I thought I'd eventually be able to put up with Roger, okay? So uh, <laughs> as <laughs> he came to, Roger Abel came to me about 12 years ago and he said, I'm going to do this and this, why don't you do it with me? And I went, no, nah, you won't work. I've been in New Zealand, I know all about New Zealand, I'll never pull together. So anyway, he got the last laugh on. So where to now in New Zealand? Um, we're keen to expand our horizons in New Zealand. We like the market, we think it's great. I think it'll be good when the um, government insurance office starts and you can compete against it, it'll be fun. Um, uh, I, I usually don't make comments like that, but I just thought I had to say something. I mean, Chatham House should, rules should apply about that comment. Okay, so about us, this is what we look like. We've been going 17 years, we've got 430 offices. I've got 20 seconds to go. 36% market share, and we billed $5 billion last year. 